Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good night. Welcome to the 2024 budget consultation for the constituency of St. David's. As it's customary, I would like to begin with a word of prayer. You can stay where you are and, um, and we'll have that prayer. Can you bow your heads? Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather here today for this budget consultation activity, we ask for your guidance and wisdom. We come together to discuss and plan for our nation's future, particularly the upcoming national budget. We pray for open hearts and open minds that our discussions may be fruitful and focused on the well-being of our community and our nation. Help us to make wise decisions that benefit all. Bless our leaders and all those that carry out the functions within the various arms of government. Grant them insight and inspire them to allocate our scarce resources wisely and justly. May all of our actions reflect your love, compassion, and unity. We offer this prayer in your name, Lord, and we ask for your presence throughout this consultation. Amen. Amen. My name is Kerry Peer. I am an officer of the Ministry of Finance, and it, the honor has been given to me to chair this evening's proceeding. We have with us here a technical team from the Ministry of Finance. We have Ms. Tonya Adams, the head of the Macroeconomic Policy Unit, and Mr. Justin, Justin Hazard, the Chief Budget Officer of the Ministry of Finance. Once again, let me apologize for the Prime Minister on the behalf of the Prime Minister. He will still be attending the meeting today. However, he's a bit delayed. Our function here today is quite simple. We are here to inform, to brief you, to give you some information as it relates to the macroeconomic policies that government has been implementing over the period of 2023, to give you some updates as to the performance of the country. We have completed the first half of the year. We have information based on the first half performance. We have projections going forward. We want to share some of that information with you as constituents because we are going into the budget preparation for 2024. We would also want to explain to you a bit of the budget process so that you have a sense of what is happening. And after all of that, we want to solicit your information. We want to hear from you. What are your opinions? What have you seen? What have you observed? Your recommendations, your criticisms, if there are any so that in turn we can take these things into consideration and in so doing inform the budget preparation process. Tonight, we would present you with a short video with an update on the, on the economy as is. And we would also have a short presentation by Mr. Hassad from the budget unit at the Ministry of Finance and with that, we hope that you would be so informed and feel free to share and to discuss with us your opinions as it relates to the economic growth and development of our country. So with that short introduction, I would like to say thank you and I would invite you to take the next five minutes looking at a presentation as prepared by the Macroeconomic Policy Unit at the Ministry of Finance. Thank you. The Ministry of Finance. I wonder what they've got in store for us for next year's national budget. Come on, let's go find out. Hi, Mr. P.S. How are you? I know we're in September now, which means budget time is just around the corner. Tell me. What can we expect to hear in the 2024 budget? Yeah, I really hope government is coming good for next year's budget. 
I must say how super excited I am by your interest in this important aspect in our nation's governance. As you know, the budget is more than just a set of numbers. It involves deciding how much money goes into the various sectors, such as education, skills and training, health care, tourism, agriculture, housing, social services, etc. Because we have to meet the needs and priorities of our nation. This is referred to as the allocation of resources. The question, therefore, is what areas do you believe the 2024 budget should focus on? I think the government should prioritize education and skills training for sure. Healthcare and job creation should be top priorities too. I think more can and should be done in those areas. Well, well, it seems as though the two of you have been secretly advising the government. Only recently, the cabinet approved several strategic areas of focus for the upcoming budget. These include education and skills development, health and wellness, economic growth and job creation, agriculture, food security, and the marine industry, just to name a few. Sounds good, but how is government going to finance all these various sectors? I hope they're not going to introduce additional taxes. Public finances are expected to remain solid next year. I don't foresee any new taxes. But I do not want to speak out of turn. We will just have to wait and see what is presented later this year by the Minister for Finance. Okay, P.S. But we do hope you will put in a good word for us. We really can't afford to pay for new taxes right now. That's a good point. Things are still a bit tough, even if the economy is recovering nicely. Yes, the economy is recovering nicely. In 2022, we had strong growth of 7.4%, and based on our preliminary projections, 2023 is shaping up to be another year of robust growth. We estimate that the economy will grow by 6.5% in 2023. The construction, tourism, wholesale and retail trade sectors are the main drivers for this growth. Government revenues are also doing very well. Collections from tax revenues have grown by 21.7%. Next year is shaping up nicely too. The outlook is favorable for continued economic expansion and the strengthening of public finances. From all accounts, the economy is being managed well, despite the risks. These include an uncertain global economic environment. Yes, earlier on this year, I heard the IMF say something to that effect. But P.S., what about national debt? During this time of uncertainty, government really can't afford to be taking on too much debt. You're correct. It is important to manage debt because too much debt can lead to financial problems. Government has been managing its debt and that is expected to continue. As it stands, all new debts are assessed within the context of the approved debt strategy. This strategy emphasizes concessional borrowing. Alright PS, although that sounds nice, what are we doing about the price of things in Grenada? It is extremely difficult for persons to save money because all of it is being spent on groceries. The cost of things in Grenada are so high. What is the government doing to fix that? Everyone has asked that question. The high cost of living continues to be a major challenge for governments all over. That said, some prices have come down, and the expectation is that inflation will ease even further next year. We really look forward to lower prices. We hope that in the 2024 budget, there will be some additional measures to address the cost of living. If I recall, some were introduced last year. Government introduced several measures to help ease the price pressures on the population, such as the removal of VAT on several food items, the reduction of VAT on electricity bills, the reduction in the petrol tax. Don't forget the $10 subsidy for electricity consumption up to 99 kilowatts per month. The government also maintained the subsidy on the 20-pound LPG cooking gas, and that was costly for government. 
Yes, yes, I remember. I am pretty sure that government will be looking at additional measures. We will certainly recommend more measures to the cabinet to cushion the impact of high prices, especially for the less fortunate. Oh yes, P.S. And government paid the retroactive pension to retired public servants, right? Also heard some talk about salary increases. Government paid retroactive pension to the tune of $75 million, which has undoubtedly contributed to the increased economic activity and job creation in the country. Some of the impact is even to be expected next year. And don't forget, this year government successfully concluded salaries and fringe benefit negotiation with public sector unions and associations. This will be putting even more money into the hands of public servants. What about major projects and initiatives? There are several ongoing projects as well as new projects in the pipeline. These include the Tourism Competitiveness Project, the Food Security Enhancement Project, the Upgrading of Health Centers, the Grenada Resilience Improvement Project, the Visible Transformation Project, just to name a few. But there isn't much more I can say at this stage. By the way, will you be partaking in the 2024 budget consultations? We will be rolling out the parish consultations starting on September 13th. So we will be coming to your area very soon. Of course, P.S. will definitely be there. A message from the Ministry of Finance. Thank you, folks. Short video with some succinct information that we believe that you would find interesting and informative for your thought process. If by any chance there's anything that you, you need explained while we're here, please feel free to ask. I know sometimes the information can, can be a bit daunting, can be a bit puzzling. Um, feel free to ask a question during the question and answer section and we'll be pleased to clarify. At this stage, I would like to ask Mr. Hazard, the Chief Budget Officer at the Ministry of Finance. This is the gentleman who would be overseeing the budget preparation process. He's going to give a brief presentation as to that very said process. Thank you, Mr. Hazard. Thank you, Kerry. Um, good night, all. Um, I'm so happy that you all turn out here tonight so we at the Ministry of Finance could give a small synopsis in terms of the budget process. My rule here tonight is a simple one, but very important one. I'll try to condense the budget process as simple and as quickly as possible. There is no way I could explain the budget process in 10, 15, or 20 minutes. But <laughs> I will try to do that in a very condensed way. Now, thank you. I always like to start my presentation with this statement. And I'll read it. The annual budget is the most important public policy tool of the government and its preparation must be done with utmost integrity and seriousness. It is the most important business of government and by extension, the state of Grenada. Therefore, the budget must be carefully formulated, which means that ministry works programs must be clear, carefully developed and well prioritized. Now, what that statement is telling you is that the seriousness of the budget to any administration. Nothing can be done without the preparation of a well-produced budget. Any requests you all will make from the administration here tonight must find its way in the estimates of revenue and expenditure, because that's the only way they can get authority to use any funding whatsoever. Yeah. The 
formulation, approval, and presentation and implementation of the budget, the appropriation act and the supplementary therefore shall be on the principle of sustainable prudence, sustainability, transparency, and consistency. Now that is telling you that the preparation of the budget, it must be sustainable, it must be prudent, it must be transparent, and it must have consistency. Now, what is a budget? A budget is a statement of allocation of financial resources which government will use to improve, improving the assistance and service providers for social, economic, and well-being of its people. Now, what that is saying that when government produce a budget, they look to, to make sure that it has impact on the populace. The budget is supposed to have some things in it for everybody to, to have some social benefit. Right? A budget is also a reconciliation process whereby people, ministers, members of the legislation, public servants, civil servants, civil um, organization, and other stakeholders engage in debate on various views and arriving at allocation of resources. And this is what we're doing here. We come to you to debate for you all, to give us your all ideas so we can put it in the, in the, in the budget. A budget statement, next slide, right. right. The budget also is a process of governance behavior of the public servants. And you might ask how does a budget um, measure the behavior of public officers. Now, we tend, and I say we, the general populace, tend to look at the figures in the budget all the time. We look and see how much money agriculture gets, how much money health gets. But there's an important part in the budget which is called the performance indicators, which shows what public officers do, what they achieve, what they intend to achieve, what the government achieves, what they intend to achieve. And these, this, is, this part, five, part, this form part of the budget, and it's helped the populace to understand and see what is done. So I, I always tell people, don't look at just, the, when you get an opportunity to look at the, the estimate of revenue and expenditure, don't just look at the figures. Look at, there are many other information inside that document which can help you um, have a better understanding of, of the budget. Right, so the preparation, budget preparation, the, the preparation of the budget starts with the policy units. The policy unit will use its metrics and, pro and have projections in regards to revenue and expenditure. They will also have the MTFF, which is the midterm framework, physical framework, which will give a very good estimate on what was spent in the first half of the year and what also was collected in the first half of the year and what is projected to spend and what we intend to collect. Now, that will form the basis of the, the budget because to have any budget, you must have revenue coming in. And the policy units will do their metrics and have an idea of what we will collect and what we will spend. Once that is done, the, budget, the Ministry of Finance will issue what you call a budget so called circular. It complies of this, the, the, the call circular will give the indication to line ministries in terms of what they need to do in the preparation of the 2024 budget and forward years 25, 25, 2026. We do the budget in the current year and two forward years. Right, so when the budget call circular is issued and these ministries get at the ceilings, the ministry and uh, um, department take in consideration the strategic priorities of government. That, and consider the 2023, 2025 medium term action plan, which aligns with the national development plan. So in any one year, the government will have its priority in terms of the budget. Um, off my head, I, um, health and wellness is high on the priority list for the 2024 budget. Digital transformation is also high on the list. Youth and education, sports is high on the list, just to name a few. So they will take these in consideration in the preparation and make sure and allocate properly for these important priorities of government.
Correct. So the budget preparation committee. So once the, the line ministries take all this in consideration and formulate the draft budget, they will submit it to the Ministry of Finance. In particular, the budget unit. The budget unit will collate what is sent and make sure that after we collate these figures, that is within government envelope. Because government will have an envelope that which is they want to spend. So if when you collate all these information coming in from the line ministry, it's over the envelope that government looking to spend, we will have to do some adjustment and some cuttings to move that process forward. Now, how we do that, we'll have selective consensation with line ministries. And we as the ministry, we as the ministry of finance don't want to come across as a big bad wolf and say, cut this and cut that. So we tell them, listen, you are over the limit. And we're asking you, tell us where you can cut so we can make the necessary adjustment. And we'll have a good negotiation, good conversation with our ministries, and we'll get to the point where we want to be. Now, a budget, right? You must have a source of fund. Each item in the budget must have a source of fund. You must know where the money is coming from. We have recurrent revenue, grant, loan, saving, and investment. The recurrent revenue are easily predictable. Is the normal revenue we collect on the port, is the property tax, income tax. Government will have a very good idea what we'll collect in any one year in regards to that. Grant funding, we'll get grant funding from friendly organization or, or governments. And you know, a grant you do not have to pay it back. It's just like if somebody gives you some money to do something and you say, listen, you don't have to pay me back, sister. I give you that to help you pay in the house and you get a grant fund. Um, loans, government will take loans in, in very um, reasonable terms from financial institutions, from government. Government will have savings once the government exercise prudence in the, any particular financial year. They could arrive savings and these savings can use to finance the budget for the following year. Also investment, government will invest in paper on the stock exchange, soft paper, so, and these bring in investments for government. So these are the, basically the five sources of revenue government will use to fund the budget. Now, in the, in the recurrent, there are two aspects of spending in the budget. There's the recurrent side and the capital side. And your current, as it says, is the normal things that even you do at your home, your rent, your electricity, your water, these are your current expenditure you have all the time. Now, if you're going to buy a fridge or a car, this will, be capital, this will be considered capital expenditure. You don't do that every month. You don't buy a fridge every month. So, but there are some recurrent expenditure which is handled by the Ministry of Finance. And electricity, water, sewage, these items are handled by the Ministry of Finance. The provision for capital items, mainly equipment, vehicles, furniture, and fixtures, are also handled by the Ministry of Finance, in exception to the Ministry of Education, Police, and Health. And you could understand why. These ministries have specific needs. We don't want to hold up the purchase of furniture for a school. Or, so the Ministry of Education have these allocations they can use to purchase. It's just the same with the police. The police has special equipment which they will require fire engine, arms and ammunition. They will have the resources to do that. And also the Ministry of Health, in terms of the medical equipment, they will have their own capital resources to purchase these items. <coughs> approval and appropriation. The budget must be approved. And there's an approval process. The first approval process of the budget, so after we collate the figures and bring, we, we are the Ministry of Finance, we'll go to the Cabinet and say, listen, this is the envelope and this is what we, we are working with. Now, at that time, Cabinet will have to approve that. Changes can be made. We might have to move around from one place to another and stuff like that. But Cabinet will have the first opportunity to approve the budget. Then we move on to the Parliamentary Finance Committee for approval. And that will have to take place at least two months before the end of the financial year. So we're looking at October as well. The Parliamentary Finance Committee is comprised of all the MPs in the lower house. 
So this gives all the MPs, as whether you're opposition or whether you're in the ruling party, an opportunity to see the budget before it even starts to be debate. Then you have the presentation of the national budget in November, December. And we know that the Minister of Finance will do the presentation of the budget. And we know the interest that has sparked in the 2024 budget debate because in the mere fact, I think it's the first time in a long time we had a, a number, a sizable number in the opposition government. So people look forward to that debate. And I think this year is no different. We look forward to the presentation of the budget by the Ministry of Finance and the debate. The budget also has to pass in the Senate, the upper house. And the Senate comprised, as you know, we have three members of the opposition, three members of the government. You have the private sector, agriculture, and labor. So we have very interesting debates going on there in the Senate in regards to the budget. Now, once that debate is over, a bill. Next slide. So once that debate is over, a bill known as the Appropriation Bill is laid before the House. That bill gives the authority to spend basically from the consolidated fund. So each and every line item ministry will have the amount. So we'll have agriculture, health, tourism, whatever. We'll have the allotted allocation. Now, no money shall be expended from the Appropriation Act or Supplementary Appropriation Act unless the Ministry of Finance has authorized the Accountant General by general warrant to pay this money out of the consolidated fund. Now, so after the bill is passed, the, the, the Minister of Finance will give the Accountant General the authority to spend, so to speak. And I will speak a little bit lower down in the presentation on what is the Supplementary Appropriation Act. So the implementation continues. When the budget is passed in Parliament, it has to be implemented. The Ministry of Finance will set out guidelines in regards to the estimate of revenue and expenditure and issuance of the ministry to the, other, to the line ministries. Now, the expenditure ceilings, department first quarter allocation are given in, in these um, guidelines. The, the quarterly ceilings are submitted once we give these ceilings, the, ministry, the line ministries will have to submit to us a cash flow, which is given to us at the 10th of the previous month, so that we, the Ministry of Finance Budget Unit, monitors and control the disbursement of funds, which gives some level of control in terms of expenditure. Next slide. Now, wh when the budget is approved and a line ministry has the allocation, Sometimes there's a need to shift around allocation. No, we cannot bring in money to the budget just so. But we can move around. We can have the pie and move some here and move some here, but it doesn't increase the pie. So line ministries have that opportunity to move allocation to different programs and different accounts. And they do that through warrants. There are two main warrants which they use, the environment warrant and the departmental warrant. Now, as, as I said, these, these warrants, um, uh, and I'll give you just a quick example maybe. Um, so let's say they have allocation on the training, and this allocation have, was not, is not moving now because part of the training taking will take place in December. But you have a need you now to buy some supplies and material, which is a different account. You can move some allocation from training and bring it to supplies and material so you can be able to fill that gap and purchase that supply and material. Now, one of, another warrant is that the movements from allocation across ministries. So you can move from the Ministry of Health to the Ministry of Agriculture. But that warrant is called a reallocation warrant. And it's more complicated. That warrant must be signed by the Minister of Finance and the PS Finance. When you're doing the departmental warrant, it's, it's handled inside. But once you're doing cross um, ministry, it must be signed by the Minister of Finance and the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Finance. The supplementary, as a member, I, I said, when you see this, the supplementary act. Now, as I mentioned before, you cannot bring in allocation to the budget just like that. 
You can move around, but the only way you can bring an allocation into the budget is through a supplementary estimate. And that supplementary estimate has to go through the same process as if you're doing the budget. So it has to be approved by cabinet. It will be it has to be approved by the finance um, parliamentary finance committee. It will debate in the in the both upper and lower house. Now, you might ask, when do we need a supplementary estimate? So, in the case of the amount appropriated is insufficient, and we cannot find allocation elsewhere to bring in, we will have to go to with a supplementary estimate. In exceptional circumstances, emergency, we have a hurricane. God forbid, we have some some extraordinary expenditure to deal with for um, the pension payment, for example, is one we had to go to the supplementary to get these funds into the budget so the government could spend. So these are some of the, the examples you will need to bring in a supplementary estimate. You can only do two supplementary estimates in any one year. Um, from my experience, being in the Ministry of Finance, one, we always do one. The budget is always sufficient, and then we do one supplementary sometime between August and September. Quickly, just the rule and responsibility of the budget unit. We coordinate and manage the development of the annual estimate of revenue and expenditure and supplementary budget. The unit is responsible for, engage, for ensuring that the process, the budget cycle, and the budget calendar is kept. Now, Everything that we do in terms of the budget preparation and is done with a budget cycle and a calendar, which is governed by the, 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 the PFM, the Public, the Public Financial Management Act. Now, we, if you notice, I don't think you ever see a budget read in January or February. The budget always read in November, December, and there's a reason for that, because we have a, 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 a cycle to keep, so the budget unit ensure that this cycle is kept. The budget units also advise government on the fiscal implication of the budget proposal and issuance arising from the implementation. So if we realize that um, expenditure is in, in a particular area is going what we expected, we will indicate it to the policy unit, indicate it to our principal, the permanent secretary, and he will make, and advise on how we can correct that. On the approval of the, the, the budget, the units do the implementation and the execution of the budget. So we implement, so we load the systems, we do all these things to implement the budget so you can have line ministry spending. Yeah. So a quick summary of the, um, the budget. So you will have the preparation of the microeconomic physical um, forecast, which is done by the policy unit. Once that is done, you have the budget framework paper and uh, once the budget framework paper is done, you have the issuance of the budget call circular, the preparation and submission of the estimate of revenue by line ministries to the Ministry of Finance, consultation with ministry and department. We have public and um, consultation. We have parish and sectorial. We deal with, when you say sectorial, so we also have consultation with the bankers, trade union, and stuff like that. Then we have the, present, the presentation of budget in Parliament by the Minister of Finance, the debate in the upper and lower house, the issuance of the general warrant, which I talk about the Minister of Finance giving the Accountant General the authority to spend, budget execution, budget monitoring, and reporting. Concluding, I'd just like to read a statement. The preparation, implementation, Monitoring of the national budget is guided by the Public Finance Management Act and other supporting laws as the Fiscal Responsibility Act, the Public Procurement and Disposable of Public Property Act. So everything we do in the budget preparation and the budget execution and spending is governed by law. We have to sell a vehicle, procure, um, disposable, Public of Property Act. We have to follow these steps to sell the vehicle. Somebody just can't walk up and say, oh, we're selling this vehicle. So everything we do is, is in law. So thank you. That's my brief question. I try to condense it as much as possible.
Thank you, Mr. Hassad. That was quite a bit, wasn't it? But I think there are some key takeaways here that we, we must always have in mind. Mr. Hassad concluded by saying that the budget is governed by law. It starts with the Constitution, to be quite frank. So it is contained within the supreme law of the land. And then we have other bits and pieces of legislation that governs how budget is supposed to be done, when it is supposed to be done. So it is not something that is done haphazardly and by whim. The process is very clearly defined. Another takeaway here is that the budget has a limit. The budget has a limit. We have a defined amount that we project to collect and that we hope to spend. So it is not money in the bank as yet. So bearing in mind that we hope to collect, we have to temper our expectations. We can try and be as efficient as possible in the collection of taxes. We can try and be as efficient and innovative as possible in how we raise the funds that we wish to use for the budget. Based on the laws that we now have, we are actually required to prepare a budget that has a surplus meaning that we do not spend all of what we collect so that we can generate some savings. And that savings is supposed to be for extenuating circumstances or major projects that we want to implement. These are things that we have to bear in mind as it relates to the budget. Mr. Hazard pointed out the budget is not just numbers. If you have an opportunity to have a look at the document, and the document is a public document, it is made available on the Ministry of Finance webpage, it is made available on the Facebook page. If you have an opportunity to have a look at the budget, please do. Contained therein are descriptions of major projects, contained therein is information on what has been successfully completed. If not completed, how far along it is. Contained therein for every ministry, you would find the ministry's objectives, what they intend to achieve in any given year, and also contained therein are the results of their performance for the previous year. So when the 2024 budget is published, you would see in there what were the objectives and what are the performance indicators for 2023 and how well they did and what it is they expect to do for 2024. So that everyone can go in and have a look and be informed as to what the various ministries are doing. If the Ministry of Infrastructure says that it's going to build 50 miles of roads and that is there as part of its performance objective for 2023, at the end of 2023, you should be able to go and have a look and see how many miles of roads did the Ministry of Infrastructure build. So you yourself can have a clear sense of whether or not your government is doing the things that it's set out to do in the budget. Because your budget is not just a set of numbers. Your budget is actually constructed, it is actually put together because it is responding to policy directives. It is not just made out of thin air. The minister and his staff didn't just sit down and say, well, all right, fine. Let's spend some money on X, Y, and Z. No. 
there are broad priority areas which are established by the various policy documents. We have a National Sustainable Development Plan, which is a long-term plan that has clearly identified certain sectors and what are supposed to happen, what are the things that are supposed to happen for that sector. We have sector plans, ministries have strategic plans, and all of these are supposed to be linked. If the National Sustainable Development Plan says that we're supposed to have a healthy functioning nation, then we're supposed to see linking to that one broad general statement as we come down. By the time we reach the Ministry of Health, we're supposed to see what are the activities the Ministry of Health plans to do so that we can have a healthy functioning nation. And your budget is supposed to be linked to that. We can't be speaking about having a healthy functioning nation and when you look at the budget, there's no allocation to run the hospital, you know. Um, there's allocation to buy a set of vehicles, but it's not ambulance. You know, it's nothing that is going to actually help us in the Ministry of Health. And as members of the population, as members of the constituency, you should be so well informed that you can go into the budget, you can look at the areas that are important to you, and you can judge whether or not what you're seeing happening confirms to what is in the budget, and the budget forms part of the law. Because every year, it goes to Parliament. There's an Appropriation Act that is approved in Parliament that is directly linked to those numbers, and is approved and passed. So it forms, it's, it, it's law, meaning that there is an obligation to do the best that you can to implement this budget. Bearing in mind all of that, and bearing in mind that the budget has a limit and is not cash in bank, you would have heard Mr. Hazard speak about giving the ministries quarterly ceilings, simply meaning that every quarter the ministries are informed as to how much you're allowed to spend. Because as fast as we are collecting, we get a sense of what is happening in the economy. We know whether or not we can afford for the ministries to spend as they plan to spend. We do a budget in, 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 in December. We are doing a budget in the last quarter of this year. Come the first quarter of next year, things might actually change. We may not necessarily perform as well as we did. And during that period, we can't just say, well, boy, we have passed a budget to spend 100 million in December, so whether we get $100 million or not, we're going to spend it. No. The ministry actually has the power, even though a million or 100 million has been approved, to say, look, based on how things are going, what we're seeing now, we're only going to collect our new projections, say, $80 million for the rest of the year. And we may have to temper how the different ministries and departments spend. And that is why very often you, you hear the term being used, we need to prioritize our spending. We need to know what are the activities that we absolutely must carry out and adjust accordingly, if so required. With that said, um, I've been informed that the Prime Minister is actually on his way, so he will join us shortly. But um, in the meantime, uh, you've been given quite a bit of information, and um, I would like to open the floor to, to hear from you. Um, it could be suggestions. It could be constructive criticism. It could be questions that you want answers for clarity. Um, please feel free to share with us. You have with us, we have with us here a capable technical team from the Ministry of Finance, and we're We've been doing this for, for quite a while, um, and we're always willing to, to share information once it's available to us. We're always willing to share and to, to clarify as much as possible. And with that, thank you for the time being. Any questions? That means everybody understood everything and is in agreement with everything? <laughs> oh, thank you. Uh, there's a microphone right behind you. 
Thank you kindly. Right. Good evening. Uh, my concern is hospital. Hospital, mm -hmm. yes. Um, because I've been to the hospital on many occasions, and what I see in the hospital is very off-putting. And a lot of people, people I know that's been to the hospital, they'd rather to stay at home than go to the hospital. So I want to know how you intend to improve the hospital so that the people of Grenada would be confident when they go to the hospital. And as I say, we want a healthy population. So we must have the, um, the hospitals or the, 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 the necess necessary things to make sure that our population is healthy. But if something should happen, they would be confident of going to the hospital. Okay, so you have had the direct experience of going to the hospital and not being satisfied with your observations. Yes. Please share with us what do you think needs to be better? Well, first of all, I think that there are not enough nurses. Not because enough on nurses. Many time, on many occasions I've been to the hospital, there are like few nurses working and um, patients are... Uh, in pain and nobody's looking after them. I've seen patients who had strokes and they were just lying there and nobody is uh, attending to them. I went to the hospital uh, to see a friend of mine who was dying and he, uh, I was sitting there and nobody was coming to, um, to look after him. I was there taking his uh, pulse, filling his pulse because he wasn't breathing properly and he died in my hands. And then I had to go and call the nurse and say, well, look, he's passed. So. So That's we're talking the, the, the staffing at the hospital. Um, uh, while you said nurses, can I, can I include doctors in that as well? Is that uh, your observation that, that you know, there might necessarily be more need for, for doctors as absolutely, well? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And on, on another occasion, a friend of mine, healthy young lady, went to the hospital to have a goitia uh, seen, talked to her the night before. She says she's quite um, happy to, to have the, 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 the operation. The next day she was dead. So, you know, things like that really puts me off going to the hospital. Really, really puts me so off. So we can also probably say quality of quality of service absolutely, as well. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. What's about the availability of, of medicine and, and, and so? Well, I mean that's a joke really. And not only that, um, I remember while I was in London, um, a hospital in London supplied a whole container of sheets and pillows and things to go to the hospital, the hospital in Grenada here. When I come down, I still see people have to bring in this, the pillowcases and the sheets and, you know, to the hospital. And I think to myself, in 2023, we still have to do that. So we haven't progressed um, in, our, in our medical um, uh, uh, thing to, the, 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 the medication we give to our population. It's really low, really, really, really low. I mean, I know, I remember like a couple of years ago, um, the last government, they said they had um, funding to do three uh, health centers. And one was this one here, and how they're going to do it up and it's going to have a, a nurse there 24 seven, um, so that if anybody was having childbirth, they didn't have to go drive all the way down to St. George's and all that. I haven't seen anything happen. So okay. I hope our government is not like that and they will be more um, ready to make sure that we have a healthy population, a population who is uh, not afraid of going to the hospital. Right. So I've, I've gotten quite a lot from you. So, you know, um, down to the, the upgrade of the medical centers, the primary health care um, in, the, in the community. And um, we've heard it, you know, um, said before that you really want to establish your your first site of treatment at the at the primary centers absolutely you know your people that people can come to the community the community health centers um get some attention there and very quickly we can determine whether or not they need to be to be moved to the the the, the central facility and even have in place the infrastructure and mechanism that when 
you know, someone attends at the, 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 primary, at the, at the health center here, that the information could automatically be, be sent straight to the hospital without having to carry papers or the, the, the actual transmission of, of physical well, if papers. It's, if it's possible, I don't know if there will be enough money in the budget to, to do that, but I mean, that would be ideal. But it's, it's, it's early to say, given that the budget call circular has just recently gone out, um, the ministries are still in the process of preparing to submit the, the budget and then in turn consult with, the, with the, the chief budget officer and the Ministry of Finance as it relates to the, the preparation of budget. But um, this sort of information that we gather now, we actually collate it and we bring it to the cabinet. So all of the recommendations that we have here now actually goes to the cabinet um, for discussion and for, you know, to, for a determination as to whether or not there is something that needs to be implemented now or something that needs to be looked further into. So I can't say to you now that, yes, this is, this is going into the budget, but I can definitely tell you that we will be bringing all of this information directly up to the cabinet for further discussion, as well as when we have the consultations with the various ministries, we will definitely raise these sort of issues. Oh, and there's one other thing before I go. Please do. Now, when something happens at the hospital that the population do not agree with, and the doctor says, we are going to look into it and get back, in, get back to you. I think they have a duty to do that. Because when my friend died, I went to the chief medical officer and I asked him. He says he's going to investigate and get back to us, the family. Up to now, nothing. So the family has heard nothing as it relates to that particular no, investigation? Matter, no, no, it's just like, oh, somebody dead, they go to the hospital and God take them. You know what I mean? That's it. Oh, that's the way it is. And I think that's not the way it is. She so wasn't, that, so this is something, uh, this is, well, I mean, from where I sit, I, I hear you saying that we, we should have a proper process yes. for, for complaints, for queries of this sort of sort where it is clearly defined, you know, um, how we go about doing it and the the response mechanism that should be tied in with that when we have these sort of these sort of investigation requests and queries and so absolutely okay, so. great great thank great. you thank you thank you excellent suggestion excellent <laughs> criticisms The thing about it is we actually have an online platform and we would like for the, okay. the persons online to also hear you. All right. There Thank are you. usually systems in place for those types of things. Um, I came to this meeting today just to hear what was being said. I happen to, in the past, work for the New York State Department of Health. And so part of my role and responsibility there was to vet the hospitals things like their dialysis centers, open those things and vet them and ensure that they had the proper mechanisms and protocols and policies in place. Now what the gentleman just mentioned, my, again, <laughs> there's usually a grievance process. So for the issue that he mentioned with the mm -hmm. patient, there's usually a place, I don't know, again, I'm getting acclimated to the system here in Grenada, but there's usually a grievance process, and there's a team that usually deals with those sorts of things. So in the case where he made a query, he raised a grievance, this patient died, what usually is the process is they send out a letter stating, okay, we, have, you know, we, we, und we got heard from you, we're investigating that, there's a thorough investigation that's done, and then there's a response back to the patient, family, whoever is doing that query. Um, I don't know. There isn't somewhat of a regulatory system here. I know that's, you know, it's a governmental platform. And there are, I mean, there are lots of things that has happened with the system. And even my own hearing, I'm not going to speak about that today. But I think we need to look at healthcare. If, we, if it's an important thing to our country and our people, we need to seriously look at that. Look at what's happening, the complement of staff. Do we have sufficient staffing to address the needs of the patients? Um, I'm also by profession a nurse, <laughs> my other life. Um, so I understand the need for there being an adequate amount of staff to accommodate the acuity level of patients. What do I mean by acuity? How bad? 
let us uh, ask your indulgence as we recognize the arrival of the member for Parliament for St. David's and the Prime Minister, the Honorable Deacon Mitchell. <laughs> Prime Minister, we are just hearing from, from the floor their concerns as it relates to the, the observations. Um, we would have presented some macrofiscal information as well as a brief, concise summary of the budget process and, and, and how it's done. And uh, we're just hearing from the floor. I'm, I'm not certain. Well, I would like to ask the, 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 the member to, to finish her, her comments and um, we'll interrupt to give you the opportunity to say a few words. And um, <laughs> Move. okay, <laughs> okay, good. So please, please continue. Okay, we do honor your presence here, but um, Prime Minister Mitchell, um, as I was saying, the gentleman before had raised a concern about the healthcare system here in Grenada. Um, and some of, I guess, his lived experience of having, you know, people that he knew near and dead to him pass away. Um, and so I was just giving a comment or a response um, as to how possibly we can maybe mitigate some of these challenges that we're encountering. One of them seems to be uh, there is an adequate amount of staff or there needs, there seems to be a a, a mass exodus of staff, a high turnover of staff. Um, as far as Grenada is, the country is concerned, our healthcare system, we train people, but then they leave for other places because there isn't what I seem to be hearing, there isn't something that sustains them here. It might be in the form of contracts, um, but in response to the man's uh, question, there are regulatory bodies usually in other countries. Um, like I said, I was part of a regulatory body. So certain things that we would have here without there, there needs to be some level of accountability. Um, I'm not, I don't, again, I'm not fully a part of the system, so I don't fully understand the challenges, but it, to just for his question, there are many people that are having a similar challenge. They're asking, what happened to my loved one? And they're not getting a response. So how do we address that? You know, putting something in place, a grievance committee. I don't know if that's in place. Again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to speak out of turn, but those are things that are typically in place in other parts of the world. There's a grievance process where they investigate and they get back to families. Um, there are other things that, you know, but I think we really, if we do say healthcare is important, we need to put the effort. I understand that we want to build this, you know, state-of-the-art facility, but there are some things that we need to address. You know, like like I said, the the complement of staff, the acuity, mm -hmm. the, the attrition of staff, that is important because I can speak from a health, a nursing perspective. I've worked most of my years in critical care, and like I said, I worked for the New York State Department of Health. So part of my experience was vetting facilities and ensuring that those types of things don't happen. You know, from anything, from the equipment, from how the food is produced, how before we opened dialysis centers and, you know, those things, I was part of that sort of a team. And I'm not here to think, I'm just here saying there was a process. I don't know what our process is, but I know I've heard, and, and even myself, I've you know, been there and just seen some things. And I know our people are trying, but we need to look at the healthcare system. From now I'm partially part of it, there's challenges with, for instance, a patient can't take the medication because they don't have food. That's a social thing. How do we get the patient to get food so they can take the medication to get the surgery that that patient needs. 
in order for him to, you know, or her to just take care of their daily needs. I know I'm talking a lot and I'm just, I'm raising a bunch of things, but being now partially part of the system and seeing some of the challenges, we need to mitigate that. Um, and if we say we're gonna open this facility, if we don't have the proper structures in place, all those other things that we're talking about, I hate to say it's a waste, but it's a waste. Let's look at the solid foundation that we need. We can't build on sand. All right, I just I'll leave it at that. We cannot build on sand. We need to build on solid structures. So if it's a grievance process, if it's a quality, whatever it is, those pieces that are needed, and I'm not, again, I don't know the system. We need to look at that, assess it, and how do we move forward? Because we can put a state-of-the-art equipment there, but if we don't have the staff to support it, it's a waste. If we don't have the proper structures in place, it's a waste. So I, I hope you hear me. I don't, I'm not trying to be negative. I'm no, just no. trying to, how do we find solutions to the challenges that we, we have? Thank you very much. Uh, excellent contribution. Um, hearing very clearly from you that we, we need to have a look at the legal and regulatory framework within which our health system operates um, to ensure that the processes are, are there, that you know, if the things that need to be covered are covered, and not just look to see whether we have the framework, but also to analyze and see whether we are implementing the way that it, it should be implemented, because the framework could exist and we could very well not be implementing the framework the way that it, it should be. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent contribution. Good night to the head table and to parties who have attended this session this evening. I'm actually on the line that the conversation started, but bit. I like to go to the, the upstream part of it. We talk about the hospital and people ill, and they talk a lot about health. And health is not getting well. Health is staying well. So the hospital gets you, when you get sick, you go to hospital. But we need to put more emphasis, in my opinion, on staying healthy so that we could spend a little more time and, and energy on how do we keep ourselves well so that we don't put that burden on the state for hospital care. But I, I, I said, because my point here is um, this evening is for us to, in our planning for health and education, we ask, we'd like to see more of our parks, social areas, for example, or playing fields, with pack for kids. So kids will develop that, that, that form of exercising as part of their upbringing so that we will have those things. Because in St. David's there, there isn't any packs for young people to go out and, um, and um, exercise and so on. Parents can take them to parks. And I, I'm saying that in, in regards to health in, in the sense of also the physical or the violence that we, we face. The care of the kids at an early stage is very important. Um, we always try to, well, I'm al always hearing the fear factor. The last one I heard is that we're going to strengthen the laws against illegal firearms, so the penalty will be good. You know, that fear factor, we're going to do something that will get you punished. I think we need to do things that will care for people and to bring better people so that we don't want it, so we will not produce the amount of persons who want to have illegal firearms. And I think that that, should be, that stage, that intervention should be very early in, in someone's life. And I would like to see that, you know, well, if I say David, that some of the budget is spent on early child care that will help build the, the young people in our society so that they will grow up healthier. And healthy here does not mean that they don't get sick, but their well-being, the health of the individual is enhanced by doing that intervention at an early stage. So I do hope the budget will pay attention to that because I do not know if you know the, 
the, the um, expenditure of the budget that takes care of the prison, Bacolet, and all the, the social issues, social spending that government have to support families and so on. I don't know if you have that because you said it is the first half of the budget. But I think that some of that money is, could go up front by caring for people. So let us apply, apply more of a caring than creating systems that are fearing. We're not supposed to want to put our people in prison and create those structures that could lock them up and to punish them. But I think we need to care for them more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent contribution. So I'm hearing from you that we want to see more holistic, preventative type activities and actions that um, not just keep you out of the hospital, but help you develop as a, as a, uh, a more holistic, you know, contributing uh, member of society. And um, just to add that institutions such as the prisons and Bacolet is not just about punishment, it's also about reform. So while I quite agree that we want to reduce the amount of persons we may want to see in the prison, um, I would always think twice about reducing the amount of allocation we have there because we are also trying to, to, to reform. But we definitely would, um, I think it makes sense, you know, looking at, at providing other services that can have that sort of preventative uh, impact that you're, that you're suggesting. Thank you. Yes. Please, my good sir. Yes, good evening, everyone. Good afternoon. Oh, good evening, sir. Um, I'm here on behalf of our polling division. I know the budgetary process is not a political one, but being part of polling division number seven, that's taking a consideration Bellevue, Providence, Debye, Mountain Ann, and those areas. Mm -hmm. And we have certain concerns that we'd like to see addressed in the next budgetary cycle. Mm -hmm. As Mr. Hazard said, we don't know if it would be allocated, but at least we want it mentioned. We don't want to get left. It's basically on more infrastructural um, items. So I don't know if that's the, here, the place for it in terms of amounts and so, but um, for instance, we need about 200 feet of, of culverts to be repaired. With Any head. particular area you want to specify the areas? Um, we, we have about five areas, um, three at um, Tebaide and two at Bellevue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we have retaining walls. In one area, it might be about 35 feet. The next, which might be, um, that's in Mount Annan. The next one in the Providence might be about 100 feet, which might be a major wall because the road might be in, um, in uh, partial collapse if it's not taken care of with the impending rain seasons, yeah. Um, we, see about drainage we need some drains constructed and that could help save the roads uh, but one thing we notice that successive governments through the ministry of works they have always been uh, mostly doing box drains but we are saying that if we concentrate box drains only where there is the actual need for them you can save by using slipper drains. Now, box drains has two walls and a concrete base. The slipper drains may only have a base and maybe one wall according to where it is. So that's a saving that the money can stretch further to benefit more. Benefit more. Um, in road repairs, it might be about five miles of, road, of roads that would be in need of repair. Um, and there are two farm roads, actually three, one to Providence Mountain, that might be about three or four, three miles. It's a good way up. There is another one through Monrepo to Syracuse. It's uh, any car could drive it, but it's, it's not in a state of actual good um, repair. There are areas which was done, the, which were done like concreted and so. And there is one that is not. It may be only be able to access by foot because I've been neglected for years. And the only time when we see the need for those roads, La Suggest has a major accident and we need an alternative route. Yeah? So there's this road from Providence which goes down to Coles Gap. Mm -hmm. Oh, and there's another one from Mountain which goes to Coles Gap. And it, just, it takes about maybe two, two to 300 feet just to 
link mountain and to coast gap and the road down there might be about 20 foot road yeah um another thing um, and i think that's about it when it comes to infrastructure but i have a personal baby i would like to speak about and Is that's it? the draft occupational safety and health act it has been sitting there since 2015 and i have a passion for occupational safety and health and we're talking about health um and it, when there is con when occupational safety and health is addressed it's mostly an investment rather than the perceived Cost. expenditure uh, whether it be on the country or on the businesses you know mm -hmm. nis has a heaping bill, bill for accidents and companies have to be paying um people for compensation compensatory claims and injury claims you know and we we need to have that mindset for people so we need a lot of training yeah and it's a niche for other employment yeah i we are where i work um we want to import some material and that material before it can go on the boat it has to be inspected and that is a job for safety yeah so we have a lot of um opportunities for training you know so that's one of my that's my personal baby yeah and there is something else no i wouldn't say about that one right now there is another consultation for that <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you again uh, excellent contributions Given the level of detail that you have as it relates to the infrastructural work, I'll invite you to please, you know, sh shortly after, please continue a little conversation with the staff here so that we can take a little bit more details. You might be very well surprised that some of these can actually be completed within the 2023 budget cycle and doesn't necessarily have to roll over to the 2024 budget cycle. Thank you again for your contributions. Good evening. Good evening, madam. Sherry George. Because I don't understand a lot of the finance business. Earlier on, I was just looking at the, what he was, Mr. Hazard was sharing. And something came to mind. You know how we like to stay outside and just talk and gossip a lot and say things that we don't know. Because for two consecutive term we did not have an opposition okay so because I don't understand the thing no, us. could you mm -hmm. just come to the finance people and say well I think I need a 500,000 US here to do something and they just get it or do they have to go through the process as we have now I mean do they have to go through the same process because so without the opposition you you hear a lot of things about money there and money this and money that so because we didn't have the opposition did they have to go through the same process so, as what I saw that, that we see there. Okay, um, to just that's for that, me, that, yeah, that's that, for that, me. That very first part. Um, if you're seeking a, a personal loan for financing of whatever project, um, it's a personal loan, then you, you would have to go to one of the financial institutions. The Ministry of Finance wouldn't um, necessarily give you, a, wouldn't give you a loan at, as an individual. However, there may be programs uh, which has grant components, um, which may have some requirements that persons can apply to and, and, and participate under and receive some form of, of grant financing. Um, however, if you're looking to finance a, pro a, a project that you have or a business idea that you have, that is a, that is a matter for the, the private financial institutions, the, the banks, the GDBs, the Scotia banks, the Republic banks, you know, um, uh, for that perspective. Otherwise, it would have to be a clearly defined project, the program that government is running. Uh, we're giving $20,000 grant for small farmers for backyard gardening, especially short crops. Fine, you can come and you can participate in that. You meet the requirements. You would most likely be able to receive the, the grant. But otherwise, you wouldn't find that government would be giving out cash to, to individuals. What has to happen is that something has to be in the budget because it was 
designed and, and approved as a project to be executed under the budget. And that budget has approved, was, has been approved. It is no law. And so we execute that project. Mr. Hazard indicated to you that if we need to bring in extra allocation, extra funds into the budget, um, and we bring in extra if we cannot find what we call savings. Something else that was supposed to happen that is not happening and we can now take that allocation and put it somewhere else to use, then we have to go through a supplementary, a supplementary, supplementary estimate which would go to parliament, parliament to be debated again. Well, um, there is an opposition based on <laughs> the, the <laughs> it doesn't change the process. It doesn't change the process. Whether you have an opposition or not doesn't change the budgetary process because the budgetary process is defined by law. The law basically outlines exactly what we do, how we do it, when we do it. And it doesn't say that if you don't have an opposition, you can't proceed or you have to change any one of the, the methodologies or anything of the sort. I just wanted to say to add to the conversation, what you may have happening is that because there is a very present um, opposition, you might hear a lot more debate. So you'd hear a lot more things coming up, um, questions being asked, etc. So those things come alive in the debate segment of the budgetary process. So you'd hear a lot more of that. That's the only thing that really changes um, in this process. That was the only query, or you had any additional questions that you wanted to raise? That's it? OK. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Please proceed. Good night, good night, good night, all. Good night. Um, most honorable prime minister, good night. The head table, protocol already established. Um, my name is Alpha Donald. Um, I'm from the village of Corinth, St. David's. Right. Um, I'm here to bring three things to, the, um, to, the, to be included in the budget. I want them a phone and I want them a piece of paper. So um, in the village of Black Sage, Black Sage Alley, that's um, that's right before, opposite the, the, yacht, the yacht in, right after Cemetery Hill. I know you all may know Cemetery Hill, right? Now there is a developing microcosm going on up inside it, you know, fast developing. And um, it consists of, you know, differently abled persons, um, a few elderly, of course, women, children, you know, and, um, uh, it is very difficult, the terrain is very difficult with the slightest rain, you know. Um, there is, uh, the, top the topography is an upward kind of challenge, you know. So, um, Mr. Prime Minister, you know, we really appreciate if you can, you know, consider this um, road to be con uh, concreted. Right. Also, additional detail is that um, uh, this road has been pleading, you know, for over some years, and they will greatly appreciate, you know, if it can be in, so, um, put into the budget for 2024. Also, this road, once completed, will connect you to um, Syracuse. Um, I know I'm not, I'm not a figures man, you know, as uh, my previous, you know, um, person, but I, I, I am assuming, give or take, approximate, um, maybe about two, two, two miles, three miles, give or take, right? Um, the next um, proposal is also in Black Stage, 
right? Um, symmetry hill. Well, the name is basically self-explanatory symmetry. It, there's a create, there's a symmetry cradled in there, right? Um, the village is greatly in need of a toilet facility or shelter um, because there um, there is ominous in proper ways and in locations person would release themselves you know creating an unhealthy environment degradation you know of the community buttressed the presence of vomits all kinds of vomits rodents you know the list goes on so the the people of the community of you know will really appreciate if you can you know most honorable prime minister for St. David's can include this, you know, <laughs> into the 2024 budget, right? Um, like I said, I'm not familiar with figures, but uh, can make um, an estimate, looking at maybe 30,000, you know, for that small facility, like a shelter, so when people come, they have a decent place, you know, to... Um, to facilitate them. My third and, and final... Um, hmm. can, I, can I just ask you for clarity? Are you saying that the, the, the shelter and the toilet facility you're asking is to be located close to the cemetery so that when persons, when there are funerals, people of have access of, to... Of course, of okay. course, Thanks. of course. Yes. Um, apparently, it's located. Uh, there's a place by there's a silk cotton. There's an area, a silk cotton. Yeah, right. Mr. Prime Minister, most honourable. <laughs> <laughs> I live in Badia. Right, and um, <laughs> well, let me. It was in the budget, yes, it was in the budget. So I just want to give you a little reminder, I give you the history. You know, um, Senator the Honorable Adrian Thomas, you know, with responsible for agriculture, land, fisheries, cooperatives, in a post cabinet press briefing, January 25th, 2023, under the, 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 the Climate Smart Agriculture and Rural Enterprise Program. He announced the Badia Road, among several other roads, I won't name them because I am advocating for these roads, I'm advocating for Badia, <laughs> right? That this road will be, com will be concreted, right? It was one of the roads that was in the budget of 2023 to be concreted, right? So, and also, he also mentioned that funding was already approved. It was available. We're coming down to the closure of 2023. So, Mr. Most Honorable Prime Minister, um, I'd like you to look into that. You know, in the ministries, you know, and um, thank you very much. Not a numbers man, but you're blessed with the gift of gab, as he said, you could talk. And that is, that is what is important. <laughs> Hi, good night. Just one sec, they're going to adjust the mic for you. <laughs> Thank you. Proceed. Good night to everyone, including the head table. Good As night, a good concerned night. citizens, I have three little issues. The first one is on health, which I witnessed today. I came from a funeral, and while me and my friend was in the terminal, her brother came with two tape on his toes, left foot, bleeding, you know? And she asked what happened. He said he was walking and he got injured on the job. So immediately, he went to the closest health facility, which was the, um, the health center in St. George's, right next to the terminal. When he arrived there, lo and behold, he said they told him they're about to close, they cannot attend to him. So could you imagine that? Your wealth have to come from your health. If you haven't got health, how could you be wealthy? How could you work? 
So what I want to know is, if there is anybody who could say to the Ministry of Health, put a little over time or something beyond four, so when somebody come with an emergency, you could deal with the person. That was very bad. Very, very bad. Right? My second point is, it might sound strange, but I have it here to let out. No, not everybody is Catholics. We are all different denomination. Mm -hmm. And what I would like to see happen, Mr. Prime Minister, I don't know if it's from the Ministry of Education, the churches, or whosoever. I would like to see that we have more schools for the different denomination of children that comes from different religion. Because sometimes, especially the Catholics, the children that attend the school, sometimes they have to go to the church for maybe every Monday morning, I don't know if it's what they call it, assembly, okay? And some of the children, I have a little one, a close one of mine going there, adopted, and he told me he has to sign himself and do other things which, you know, he does not do. So it would be good in the future if we have schools which has different denomination names so the children can have a choice based on the education in growing up. The last point, okay? I goes by the name of Mags Local Craft and Spices. And too much time, too many times, that when I hear certain things where you could apply, I have friends that told me that they would not do it when it come to them because they had tried and that what had happened. But tell me, you know what had happened? And it happened to me too? Now when you send out a form, for instance, after COVID, I fill out a form in December because I couldn't go out and sell my craft, do any business. I register under tourism. I was told, fill out the form, they would assess it and see what can take place. I was home. When you give your bank account number, your bank name, your name, your age, how much children, whatever personal information you have, Mr. Prime Minister, there should be a team. If you're not successful, relate back to that person that has a contact number and let them know you are not successful. Thank you very much. But it does not say anything and they keep all your information, which I don't like. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent sharing. If, if I may comment on the issue of the denominational schools. Um, government does not support or more than any other, any denomination over the other. The denominational schools are normally opened by the denominations. So if you want more schools of a particular denomination, you may have to lobby the church involved. Yeah. We do have non-denominational schools. Now, I could very well imagine that where the school is may not necessarily be close enough to facilitate you sending a child to a non-denominational school. That is, that is part of the, the battle that you would have to grapple with. You know, but um, and I, I agree with you 100%. I believe in communication. If you've communicated to me, I believe it is only respectful that you get a response from me, whether the response may be favorable or not. I agree with you 100%, and that is something I think we should take note for all government agencies. Okay, good night to everyone. Um, my name is Kim Modest. I'm from Windsor Forest St. David. As, well, three issues. Two on infrastructure. There is some, I think is five or six hundred of road in the Shrewd Cottage area. I know the Prime Minister would have been there more than once to look at that area. This piece of road was allocated and I think it started, the work on that piece of road started and more than a year or so now, the work has halted. Needs to be finished. 
and it's not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. um, I would like for it to be completed because there is a whole village of people suffering from that piece of road. The second piece on infrastructure is the La Pastora Road. Mm -hmm. Also, that road has been started and again, it's done. Nothing is being done there now. So, again, and that piece of road, just a couple of days ago, there was an accident in current. Right? And that piece of road could have taken past that area, I think. So then, because all the buses would have come through Windsor Forest, that same street cottage road, and go up the hill and has to go maybe all back to St. Every School and back down to current to drop off who they has to drop off instead of that piece of road would have been able to walk and walk easier for them. Okay, so that's why infrastructure. Now on the aspect of training and training young people, in my opinion, is, would be of a dire need for the hospitality section and the yachting section. There is two places that we could capitalize on. Um, some years ago, I think it's 2013 and 2014, I took it upon myself as a chef and started training young people. It was money from my pocket. At that time I was working. It was money from my pocket and everything. And then I started getting funding from an uh, overseas agency. This funding has since stopped. And I have, would have trained upwards to 25 or 35 students. Now they're in the hotel industry, four, 25 of them in the hotel industry, 15 of them uh, above the range where I have reached. Mm -hmm. So then that training would have sent them right. The students from Nulu and Tam CC, while I was in the hotel industry, I would have had to do their training and sign their training form when they come in on internship. So I would have trained even a lot more from that. Now training students in that area would benefit us and benefit us significantly. The yachting industry, again, right now I'm in, into yachting. And there is a field that, you know, a lot of people could explore. And very few doing it. There is need for captains on most of those yachts and foreigners coming in now to do it. There is need for chefs on those yachts, foreigners again. Right now there is about six foreigners doing these works in Grenada. And if we train our local people, then there isn't a need to bring the foreigners in to do it, to get it done. So I'm asking for a need for training for young people in Grenada so then they could exploit these fields. Okay. No, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty clear that we, we probably don't have as, well, existing training in the yachting industry per se. Um, but you're, um, am I getting from you that what we have at the hosp for hospitality, as it relates to TAM, CC and NULO, that you think that needs to be expanded even further? Yes, because the students that come from NULO and TAM, CC, mm -hmm. they are minimum. Okay. I'm looking at training people at a higher level, at a higher level okay, good. so then they can take, because um, there is levels in the kitchen that I work in. Of course. And students from Tam CC Nyolo, they're at the bottom. Okay. Maybe we don't have the executive chef being Grenadian, and we could have it, right? But we have the executive sous chef being Grenadian, the CDP is being Grenadian, but right now most of them are foreigners. Okay. And I've trained people who are now CDPs and executive sous chefs. And I didn't reach that level. Okay. So we Understood. could get it done. Thank you for that clarity. So uh, I just want to comment on the La Pastora Road and on the Steel Cottage Road. Um, and maybe to explain why we have the challenge of uh, implementation. So in the case of the Stuart Cottage Road, you know, this was a road where a contract was awarded to a contractor uh, before the elections, rightly or wrongly. Now, so it's a private contractor that the Ministry of Infrastructure would contract with, and that person has a contract.
to, to, to implement and the Ministry of Infrastructure has the responsibility to supervise to make sure that they deliver on time. And what would have happened as in many of these instances, and that's one of the challenges that we have to grapple and solve, is that you have a contractor who doesn't have any money. He has no working capital himself. So if the government gives him 30% of the money to mobilize, and if he doesn't use that 30% to actually mobilize and he spends it anywhere else, you're immediately in trouble because he's unable to, to, to start delivering even on the mobilization. And then if he has bad credit and he can't get gravel and concrete to deliver the concrete, then we get stuck. Uh, and then, you know, I'm just giving a real examples of how these things work out. So you end up to a point where if it was 200 feet of road, and the contract was $150,000 and it should be completed in three months, you end up in a situation where $125,000 is spent, you only have 50 feet of road. Well, in that case, you didn't even have that. What you have is, 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 is drains and the road is left. And, and in fairness also to, to the contractor, because sometimes they're in, in construction, there are always acts of nature, like excessive rainfall. You obviously can't mix concrete with rain falling. And you might have mobilized the morning, you get there, you bring men on the site and then it rains out. And so there are some cost overruns and so on. But the bottom line is one of the challenges of a lot of these smaller type, concrete type projects is contract management and construction management where contracts are awarded to people who they themselves don't have the capacity. And it's not even just the small contractors, even big guys who build schools and so on. They literally cannot move unless they get a payment from the government. And if they themselves are not managing their funds uh, properly, and if the government is not sitting on them and making sure that they manage their funds properly, um, then you find, you find a situation where you're always being shortchanged, and I'm saying you meaning the entire country, because the government is being shortchanged, short taxpayers is being shortchanged. I mean, I spent the entire day today in the Ministry of Infrastructure as part of a budget consultation talking about how do we restructure the ministry and what is the skill set that we need to actually manage construction and contract management, because that's one of the main problems. So we ended up in a situation where the contractor essentially couldn't deliver, so you had to terminate. You didn't have to essentially get a new contractor. But the government has procurement guidelines as to how we do things. So you end up in a situation now where you have to recost the entire outstanding works. Uh, you do a recosting, you then find you are actually paying substantially more. You then have to, with that costing, uh, invite other contractors now to bid. These contractors have to bid. You then have to evaluate their capacity to do the work. And, and I want to say this because people could tell you everything, answer every question on paper and then they may not actually have the capacity to deliver. So you still have to actually evaluate whether or not outside of them ticking all the boxes that in reality they can actually deliver the, the job and then after that evaluation you then have to go to what is called a procurement board who then has to sign off and say yes, this person can get the contract. And then you then basically have to start the process all over again. And effectively that is what has happened with, with Stuart Cottage Road. Um, but I believe I'm keeping my fingers crossed, all things being equal, we should be in a position to have a contract awarded and for work to resume. Uh, and, and hopefully we can get to a position where the road is completed before the end of the year. And, and what I'm describing for Stuart Cottage is, is to some extent a similar undertaking with La Pastora. The La Pastora road is part of a, a larger collection of roads which were called the uh, Farm Roads Project, which were all, I think it's 9, 10, 11 roads, which were all awarded to a single contractor. No, it's not a decision that I was part of. Just off the top of my head, the idea that you give one contractor uh, double-digit concrete roads to build all over the island tells me it's a recipe for disaster. The, the bottom line is, for similar reasons like that which I've, I've outlined, including uh, issues like cash flow, issues like the ability to deliver concrete, because concrete roads, there are basically only two main concrete supplies in Greenland, gravel and concrete, and Kenny trucking. And so if you, if you don't have good credit with either one of them, how are you getting the concrete? Um, but we, we, as recent as yesterday, we had an all parties meeting with the Ministry of Infrastructure, Gravel and Concrete, Kenny Strucking, Hanover, the, the main contractor, um, to find a way to move some of these roads, including La Pastora, including the, the, the quarry road in Telescope, including the Claboni Road um, and the bridge in the, 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 the Willis Bridge in Northeast that that contractor also has. And we believe we should be in a position, I should have a memorandum by Friday that would allow for the subcontracting of the works at La Pastora 
uh, the quarry road in telescope and Claboni to Kenny's trucking so because they're actually in the business of concrete so that we can actually get the concrete poured and the roads built because in La Pastora to a large extent that is what the hold up is actual concrete so I am optimistic that uh, by next Monday we should have an agreement in place that will allow for more rapid uh, increase in the, the the rate of delivery of, of of these roads so I just wanted to give that update and that's part of the challenge I, 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 you know as a citizen if if no one is communicating or explaining what's happening uh, that's part of the, the challenge which I also raised with our Ministry of Infrastructure which doesn't have a communication unit or a communication person or a spokesperson to actually brief the public on almost anything that the ministry is doing and it's one of the things we will have to address as part of this budgetary cycle because if someone isn't able to communicate to the residents of La Pastora why the road has stopped what the challenges are and there may be genuine legitimate challenges if for example there's no sign on the island then you can't mix concrete um, but they need to know as our chair was saying um, if we are not communicating with people that's probably half the problem the problem right there. so I certainly I'm given the the public undertaking certainly from the Ministry of Infrastructure perspective to make sure and I think we are well on the way to doing so to have a communications person retained so that we can begin uh, communicating with the public what is happening when it's happening if there are issues what those issues are and how we intend to to, to tackle them so uh, all things being equal um, hopefully our profile and our communicating with the public will increase uh, dramatically in 2024 coming out of this budget consultation process as well. So thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Hi. Good night, everyone. Good night. Um, so my name is Keisha Adams. I'm actually a medical doctor practicing in the U.S. and I specialize in general pediatrics, um, but more specifically, I did extra training in adolescent and young adult health. So the things I'll address, uh, one is mostly associated with health and specifically with teenagers, just because that's the group that I work with. And then just one more topic about infrastructure. So I guess one of the things that I wanted to you know, suggest when it comes to advocating for in the budget is, I don't know, a program to help with like alcohol and substance abuse. I mean, I think it will, you know, when it comes to just our culture, carnival, in some ways, I feel like alcohol is glorified. You know, a lot of our songs talk about drinking rum and having a fun time. So I would encourage, you know, I would like for us to have programs to help people who are suffering from alcohol abuse, as well as engage in education to help decrease the consumption of alcohol, because I think it will definitely benefit um, when it comes to traffic accidents, you know, I mean, it would help health in general. The other thing I wanted to address is mental health. Um, in the Carnival Queen show, we saw that it was one of the issues one of the um, contestants discussed. And, as, and I, from what I understand, um, in the youth consultation, it was one of the things they did bring, bring up. So one of the things I would suggest is engaging in decreasing the stigma associated with um, being diagnosed and being treated for you know, mental health issues, specifically anxiety and depression. Um, in addition to that, I feel like it would, be, it would, ben it would benefit us for having um, some sort of you know, way to screen patients, um, you know, adolescents, youth, so that we can easily, first of all, early identify if they're suffering something and be able to you know, prevent it from getting to places where it's, you know, where it gets to, you know, unfortunately, suicide attempts or even suicides specifically. Um, then the other thing I kind of wanted to address was, uh, I guess, programs for edu educating adolescents and young adults um, to help prevent individuals from becoming victims of sexual assault, as well as helping to prevent individuals from engaging, being predators um, or perpetrators of sexual assault. I think, you know, from what I see on social media, a lot of people discuss uh, about the laws associated with, um, you know, pun punishing individuals who became, who are perpetrators of sexual assault. I think one of the ways we can decrease it is by preventing, you know, giving people a voice uh, um, for where they could report, uh, you know, confidential services, where they could report, uh, you know, that they're a victim of some form of sexual assault and ultimately, you know, see some action being done to protect them so that, you know, they'll feel confident in the system in general. And then 
something outside of health, which I wanted to um, talk about is just on the main roads. One of the things I noticed is that our main roads where we're expecting free flow of traffic, the road is broad, allowing cars to go both ways. A lot of, a lot of people are using the main roads in some ways as their personal garage, you know? And it, it causes, it just prevents the free flow of uh, traffic, uh, you know, it makes it a lot un more unsafe when it comes to, you know, people have to stop, then you, you can't see the other vehicle come in. Um, so I, I would say more specifically the main roads, I understand roads to villages, you know, where there isn't a whole lot of traffic flowing, I think it's reasonable, but I would say for our main roads, we c if there is some way we could kind of decrease how, you know, people park in their cars for whole 24 hours along the main roads to just help with the free flow of traffic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Excellent suggestions. Okay, good night to everybody. Good night, good night. I am Anne Hippolyte. I born and grew right at Bellevue here. And I'm a concerned person standing here. And I trust that what I have to say that persons responsible, I think it fall under the Ministry of Education, sorry, Health, to look into it. Um, what is put into place for people, seniors that are dementia, that are going through the senile, as we may say. Um, we really, really, this is a concern for me because only lately, sometime last, only this year, that it happened to my senior brother. And it, is, it was very hard and challenging for us as a family to look after him. He become a, a community, um, the community has to be searching all over. We have to be searching for him. And we never saw this one coming and we never learned how to deal with it. And um, he grew up f being a police officer in Grenada, traveled abroad, came back, and whatever, however he chooses to live his life, he has nothing. When I tell you nothing, there is nothing. So you have nothing to look at. He don't have a bank account. He don't have a home. He, don't, he had one son that died sometime last year in Canada. That was his little tap-up source. And um, he don't have a home. Now he's in one of my brother's little shack, just a little shack. Now there is no electricity. The place is rotten. It is bad. And he just all over the community, times we have to be all around here searching for him, thank God for good neighbors. Um, we get called different places we have to go searching. And I really concerned because we are not in a position as families to really help him in that area. So I want to know, not only for he, after seeing that it really become a concern of me, how can the government help or put a, a home in St. David's or maybe in the other parishes for people like that, that they can associate and, and learn things. And I realize that he need places where the doctors can look at him and help him out. And if you're talking, he sits with you and he talk. Once you're off, we cannot watch him in the night. We're not there in the day. So you could see, give him breakfast and, and bathe him and see that he's clean. But when you turn your back, you can't watch him every time. In the night, he's gone. Um, you will just stay and get a call and he's somewhere down Dodma. You have to run, get vehicle, and it's kind of challenging. And I think it's not only for he alone. There is other people, senior, that need help. So I think looking going forward in the budget, where can places be built and structured for patients like these? And I really, really, it really, really touches me that not only he, I concern and plus somebody that care for seniors. I like going to visit the home. So set it up and um, I can do volunteer work to go in and look after them, care for them. But I'm saying they send social services come and they look at him and the same thing, sir, I will get back to you and never get back. I think it's bad the people sit in the different ministries, you go and they take documents for whatever it is, and listen, ma'am, I will get back, so I will get back, and they never turn back to say, this is the case, and this is what we can do, and I think you need to communicate back with people, know so you know where you stand. Right now, I took him to the health center, and they said, go, and you're going to get um, a social worker to talk with you. And I went in the office, and they spoke with me and said, did somebody come to look at him? I said, yes. But still, up to today, no help. No one called. They came, they took all the information of Bellevue, and they never come back. 
and he's in a state where he definitely need help. So I'm saying, is there any way that you can look into the matter for him, but also in the going forward in the future, what can be done for patients like this? Thank you. I'm hearing two things from you. I'm hearing not just the issue of dementia and illness of that type um, that may not be very common here and as a result our ability to, to deal with it, the knowledge that we have as to how to deal with these things, um, that being something that is weak and needs to be strengthened. And also I'm hearing from you that we need to have some sort of mechanism in place to, to help elderly persons who may not necessarily be, be able to, to look after themselves uh, for whatever the reasons may be, whether it is the fact that they don't have a, an income source or whether it's just that they, they're ill and they need some sort of, sort of assistance. And so as well as I'm hearing from you that, the, that communication, um, specifically as it speaks to your case, I would say let us take a little bit more information from you afterwards and um, let us see whether or not we can we can do a little research and, 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 and query as to what is happening and what is the, the hold up, you know, at least. On, I can't guarantee you what the response will be, but at least we can find out what's, what's going on. All right? Okay, thank you. Please. Good evening, good evening. Good evening, sir. All right, I am Dr. Williams from Coles Gap, right in next door, and I'm here to help you. Right? I'm here to help you. And when you see me, think of the arts. Mm -hmm. And I've been championing the arts for a few years now. And now that I see that it has given some wings to fly, I would follow wherever the discussion is. Mm -hmm. And because St. David has the most amount of artists, powerful artists, talents in every single field, I am saying that we need something quick, fast in the budget to look at building or growing the performing arts in St. David. So I'm here to also ask the minister, our representative and the prime minister to come in the back road in Coles Gap. We have the first performing arts school that has been operating since 2016 out of our own funds. And we have been sending students to do CSEC, CXE. You're here every year to talk about theaters, getting ones. We are part of that always. But we use the disadvantaged students. Those without money, they say the parents poor, they're hungry. We feed them and we train them in the back in Coles Gap. And we sell them and do CXC all getting grade one. So if we get a place as big as this, we have land already. You don't have to buy land for me. Just give me the material. We pull on the building and we train more people for free. And we sell in more this year again for free, over 20 of them to do CSEC theaters. Because out of that, you get a lot of skills, professions, opportunities to make money. So why I say I'm here to help you because the creative arts makes money very quickly. All right? Because I'm also trained in film, drama, dance, music, I have a lot to offer. And you see, I ain't so young again, right? And I've made my mark in Grenada and Jamaica. You could just research me. You'll see. I don't want to blow all that trumpet here tonight. But the point is I'm here back to, to give to the community, to give to Grenada. But when you speak, nobody listens. You get me? They feel that you feel you know too much. So I, I know a lot. I ain't know too much. I know a lot. So I come to tell you that, for example, when we grow our artists in Grenada, having lectured in Jamaica, and I realized that the artists in Jamaica, as I keep saying, come and take all of our money and go back. It is time that we export our local artists to these countries. So we put our team together. We say we have ambassadors. Let's put the team together, export them. Send them out to Canada, J Jamaica, New York, England, wherever you want to send them. Let us put the team together so we can decide and bring real money back to Grenada. We're wasting time. It could happen now. And then when you look at the CSME certificate, few artists know about that. Few performing artists, skilled people know about that. But when you sell that, you know how much money you're getting coming in there? Think of the, the thousand or the 200 artists that come. And if you sell that for five, if it's 500 or 700 to get it, think of the math. Right? So we're making good money. They say, I ain't come to beg alone, but I come to help you. So that if we implement this quickly and we go on a drive to get artists to get these certificates, we're in for a good. So when we take the money to send it back into the country, we can help more persons. Adding more value to this. I have spent the seven years to develop a program that helps people with abuse, suicidal depression, suicide ideation, trauma, and anxiety. Right now, I'm helping six persons secretly because each time I go public, they try to kill me. But I'm helping persons who the system, and this is no joke, who the system say they can't help no more. 
Only come in the back in Coast Gap, you go see where we are doing it on the concrete. I'm helping persons who they say the system can help. Doctors give up on them. Counselors give up on them. But they come by me, and we do the magic in the back in the road. Why? I use drama as therapy. And we dig into a lot of things and help a lot of persons to cleanse, only to realize that they don't need the drugs and the tablets and the pills. It's just some form of expression to dig out the challenges that they are facing. It's happening right here in Senevis. So my call is to help me to train some more people, a persons, give me some, I ain't asking for money, but give me some opportunities to empower more persons so that me alone can do it. I've spent enough time developing it as a project. I have a framework so you don't have to invent anything. It works. And I've done a lot of work with the Youth Rehabilitation Center. So if you want more progress, it is here. And I hear finally, um, there was mention about mental health in terms of um, dementia and so on. I know that because my mother had a taste of it. And I used the arts to get her out of it. And people ask, yeah, you did that for real? Yes. Expression. Sometimes you get clogged and you realize that they don't even remember your name. Who is that person there? All of that. And when you get them to express and cleanse, we've been doing that in Coast Gap in the back road. But as I say to you, since 2015, I beg in. And the more I beg is the more they bury me. So, Mr. Minister, I want you to take a drive. The road kind of narrow in the back. Come to the back road. Come and see where we are. Come and see what we are doing. And the final thing, because we've used the moment to train artists, we help some of the queens. And mental health is a big challenge. I wouldn't go further on that, but it's a big, big, big challenge. That's why I've spent my time to do this to offer. So I can help social services, I can help education, I can help culture. We have a lot to offer. Let's go send the bits. That's where the power lies. I would pause here. Thank you. Excellent contributions. Um, I believe you have a lot more to give to us. So before you leave, I would, I would like to ask you to please take some contact information from us so that we can continue that, that conversation. All right? Thank you. Anybody else? Any other contributions? We've had some. We had a very nice flow. Oh, please. The mic. Thank you. OK, this is for our, uh, my local community. I live on Redgate Drive. And I've been trying for the last 10 years to get the road repaired. And they've done about seven scopes. And they said they had the money to do it. But then they came and did some drains and made things worse. And um, the road is just in a mess. Whenever it rains, it's just like a little ravine running on the road. There are two roads that run off Redgate Drive. There is Bayview Road that takes you back down to Canal. So if there is a, an accident in, let's say, after Redgate Drive going towards um, La Pastora, the only way you could get through is to go through Bayview Drive. And that needs to, this road, I think, is vital. It should be done just in case there is an, uh, an accident. Secondly, the other road that runs off a Redgate Drive is um, Ocean View Drive, but that's a dead-end drive. The thing is, the garbage truck does not go down there, and everybody brings their garbage and put it right in front of where I live. <laughs> Sometimes they put it there too early in the morning or late at night, and the dogs bust it up, and it mess up everywhere, and my yard and everything, and I've got to get up and clean it. So I would like the government to do something about having a turning spot at the end of Ocean View Drive so that the garbage truck could drive down there and collect the garbage instead of everybody dumping it in front of my uh, building. And to make sure that Redgate Drive is done, please, for the last, as I said, 10 years. We've been, as the Prime Minister has driven up there, he's walked up there, saying, no, how bad it is. I don't even have to tell him. Thank you very much. Thank you. I see one more. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. Good evening. I, I wonder why, you. why that reaction. You are a well-known gentleman in the, in the community. <laughs> Welcome. Please, your contribution. OK. Um, I'm one of the persons who I, you, I would safely call myself a 
an activist in the, in the community. That okay. has been my life. And one of the things that I that is pa I'm passionate about right now is for the development of this very said area where we are at right now. Mm -hmm. It was a hub of activity in the past. We would have had steel band, football, cricket, netball, volleyball, you name it. It happened here, including St. David's Parish Sports. That's for the, at the primary school level. Um, <laughs> over a period of time, this playing field here has been neglected for a very long time. Because if I'm going to go to the fine print, it took 21 years to open back the drains around this playing field here. 21. Every Saturday, we run a football program in this playing field here. And we help children. We, we actually had, in recent times, we had one player, one football player reaching to play at national level. And that was an, an, a good achievement for us because he came from down there to reach this level. Excellent. And it was a struggle to get him to reach at that level. Now, what I'm looking at from a community point of view, I would have spearheaded forming an NGO, which we would have had very good assistance from certain individuals, which we are very grateful for. And we're looking to get this area here developed. We're looking to make this area here become a hub of activity that would empower people to encourage commerce, social activities, friendships, not leaving out the, the older folks who had set the standard for us to be here today, we want to involve them, build a bridge between the youths and the older folks, so our traditions, our culture, whatever we have, would be sustained, so we would be able to be a community that is bonded together and be an example to start a movement across our beloved country. Because we have seen the, I don't want to use the word demise. I would say the downfall of the social values that we face right now that needs to be addressed. Sports is one of the, the venues, the avenues, sorry, that we can use to bring that social value back, bring the competitiveness, the honesty, and all the, the positive things that you could possibly think about, bring that back into the community so we'll be able to, to channel thoughts into, I'm not talking about brainwashing anybody, but channel thoughts into positivity and not just, okay, be reactive in a violent way. Because it makes all of us shame. And it brings suffering to all of us. So, first of all, I'm asking for within the upcoming budget, if we can start off with having the playing field being addressed from a leveling point of view and a lighting point of view. The group I am part of, we are willing and we've been making strides to have this to happen. 
including doing music also because i'm fond of music and the cultural arts so my brother on the side here he has company and we're very good friends so i know there would be a good collaboration to get something like that happening so down the line all i'm asking for is for us to have the development started and our group is going to help as much as possible. I have made contacts off island and we have two diaspora groups who are in the process of getting musical instruments so we can start. So we have something up and running. So that's all I have to say for now. Thanks much. Thank you. I don't think your ask is too large of an ask. We do have the Ministry of Ports with a, a, a line item that speaks to the maintenance of, of playing fields and, and so forth. And if there is some level of maintenance that needs to be done to this, this particular field, um, it might be, I can't speak for the Ministry of Sports, but it might quite be possible that something can be done within this budget cycle as it relates to, to your request. Um, I would have liked to hear, however, a little bit more as to what, thinking of government as an enabler, what more do you think is required to, to reverse that decline of, of, of probably all of that sort of community and, and social activities that was once so rich in the, in the area here? I mean, um, what you're doing is commendable and I, I, you know, I congratulate you on it. But are there any other, any other things that you think government can do to assist in, in, in getting that, that energy back up? The, let me just start by saying, St. Davis is a very historical place. There are a lot of things that people who live in St. Davis don't know about. I think what we can do is to visit those, th those things. Because, for instance, how many of us here know that there was a military hospital on top of that hill? Or how many mills, works from slaves? That is right in our area here. Right down in Sherry, at the bottom there, there is a, a, the, the starting of a canal that would have carried across the main road down there to a mill, slave labor. How many persons know that? How many persons know that this area to below the church across by the secondary school was a uh, Amerindian settlement. Prime you can Minister. find artifacts all across those areas over there. It looks as though we might have to invite the historian to the region or to the area. <laughs> <laughs> and with the assistance of persons such as yourself, document some of these um, some of these facts. All right, so opportunity to do that for the 50th anniversary of independence. Mm -hmm. Remember, each parish will be given an opportunity to, as part of the celebrations, to decide how it wants to celebrate and mark the, the occasion of our 50th anniversary of, of independence. So um, the celebrations will run for a year. A lot of the sort of traditional celebratory activities would be in, naturally in St. George's. But post the 7th of February, each parish will be given an opportunity to pick a particular month and to either celebrate throughout the month or plan an event or events um, to mark how it wishes to, to be known, so to speak, for that period. So I think it will be an opportunity to write and document that which you are so eloquently uh, telling us. And there are quite a few other historians in St. David, so I'm sure we'll be happy to help contribute to that exercise because it's important for us to to do so. There is a documentation and his, historical subcommittee as part of the national committee, and they probably would need help as well because they may be focusing on national events as opposed to more geographic specific locations. A part of the exercise also includes a discussion as to whether we want to rename our streets or major junctions or particular buildings and so on. So those are part of the, that's part of the exercise that we will undertake as well. So you have the, the makings of a nice little community type project right there. Yeah, and mm -hmm. actually, the group that we have is St. David's Advancement Organization. That's the name of it. 
So, as the word says, advancement, it doesn't limit us to anything special, but things that would be very special. Thank you. All right, folks, we've been here for a little over two hours. Um, at this point in time, I would once again just offer the Prime Minister the opportunity, if he so chooses, for some closing remarks, and we'll, we'll close at, at that. You want me to pull you? Oh. Uh, Mr. Azad, thank you. A pleasant good evening. Sorry to be um, late, but um, there are certain things that I belong to St. Louis, and I think we have a vacuum. Now, there are a number of areas of interest I would like to the budgetary people to take a look at. One of the areas I would like them to take a look at is La Soce. There is a piece of land apparently that has been set aside for the community. And um, a number of activities can take place there. You know, one of the, the area can be designated as a historical site in relation to the, the toughest tongue in Grenada, right? So that's one aspect of it. So monuments, as the celebration committee wants to set up monuments, so monuments can be set up there because <clears throat> we have a long history. Another um, component of that site can be a park where the community can come and sit down and relax, all right? Another component of that site can be an area where fishermen, because we have a lot of fishermen in Grenada, and a lot of the times their boats are in these little bays and they get sabotage. And that's a big problem. The engines get stolen, sometimes people burn the boat, they steal their boats. So a lot of people want to become self-employed because they see we have very rich resources around us. Right? And people want to become self-employed, but they have no secure place to keep their boats. So if we can get a jetty in that area with some of the facilities where they can um, freeze um, the crowd and get ice and so on, you will find a lot of more people getting into fishing in St. David's. So that area has three components. I hope it can be seriously looked at because the land is there. All we need is the, the budget, and um, we have all the technical people in the ministry. Most of people know the history. Uh, and then it's a tourism area. You have a massive hotel on the other side, right? And um, tourists usually walk over to the marina I know before and um, have supper and so on, right? So you have the marina and you have the hotel. So they're, they're, before there are, used to be all this traffic between the marina and the other, the other smaller hotel. Now we have a bigger hotel, right? So, and it will give the tourists another um, part of the activ additional activities to take place when they come in because I always start them coming in a country. Because you go to Barbados, everybody bring, bring in ice things, right? There you can create a fishing village, you have a park, and you have a, a historical site which tourists will love to visit. Because especially the French, and the British, because they were the first people who were involved in that, and their grandchildren like to come and see where their four parents died. So that's for La Soce, right? Another aspect of um, development I hope I can see is the natural box. I want the Prime Minister mention it. No, um, natural box is a historical site. And I want it to be uniquely developed, right? Now that place can be a historical site, and what we can do is have a proper restaurant, right? Where um, locals and tourists can come and enjoy our local cuisine because we really don't have a proper restaurant in St. Davis at the international standards. Not every tourist wants to go eat in the hotel, right? Another aspect of that project in Las you now we have a stage in the yard. Now there's a lot of focus on the creative arts. So that stage in the yard can be used. You know, in Trinidad they had Antique, and they had um, another program for the, for the Indians where they come and showcase their talent. So 
a restaurant, historical site that have been involved in, 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 a, in, 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 the, in that project, where we had created a museum downstairs, and there was plans to rethink the place, but the project was breached and it had to be stopped. But there is financing. You know, in my time, I had allocated $4 million to work on that project. You know, and I know there is financing, and it's free money. You just have to have know where to go and look for it. All right, so the creative art. So the tourists come, they visit the historical site, they patronize the restaurant, and maybe one, three times a week, you can have time for comedians, mm -hmm. you can have time for singers, because mm -hmm. a lot of young people now, they have talent, but there is no avenue. In the early days, we used to have Marisho Theater. You know, children are creative, but we, are, we have not given them, you know, after the, the um, Geary and then revolution, there is not no, you know, opportunities for, for students to, de to develop and pursue their creative abilities. You know, so that Lassages site, you know, can be developed. You know, see how um, Belmont Estate, you know, develop a product around an estate, and that may have a lot of history around it. You know, so I would really like, you know, the budget, because it need money. <laughs> I would really like it, because, you know, with all these tourists coming in, we have to find you know, areas of interest for them to go. So this is a, the Lasso say is a tourist site. Natural Works is a tourist site, all right? Another area I want to touch on is Lasso just plain field. Now, there is an area in Lasso just plain field that was cast as a tennis court. I had approached the, um, the, the past minister for St. David's to establish a tennis court, and we had an agreement I had um, equipment donated, and um, one month later, they went and put a stage. And nobody seems to know who's responsible for taking out that stage. I realize it's, it's, it's come like a popular thing to have prayers and, and, and call it. it can be relocated in another part of the, 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 the place, you know? Because my passion for lawn tennis and the young people, because you just had a queen, a Calypso queen, um, Carnival queen, Carnival queen from St. David's. She used to play lawn tennis. You know? Eh? She, you understand? You know, so I, I know that I've been associated with lawn tennis a lot of years. A lot of you don't know. A lot of scholarships mm -hmm. are given to students in Grenada true lawn tennis, but they only go to the students in town, right? Because no facilities and no programs has been developed for the outer parishes. So a lot of the, the, the talent in the outer parishes is stifled because there, is no av there are no avenues for those students to develop themselves, right? So I, I really want us to look at that. Now we have West Tower Secondary We have to stop building schools and not building the proper sporting facilities that go around. We copy America, we copy everything. Chair, nails, pants below bottom. And American schools have gymnasiums. They have basketball court. They have, you know, all the facilities to give you a well-rounded education. So why we can't copy that? You know, we have been independent for so long. Look at West Tower Secondary School. You know, it appears if $100 million was budgeted for our school, $50 million disappeared. Nobody asking a question. A sporting facility should be on that. Netball, basketball, on lawn tennis, on that court, you know, and, and in, in, on that compound. So the school can have a well-rounded curriculum and give students the opportunity to pursue whatever talents that they have. Another thing that we need in Grenada, we build building other hotels, inviting other tourists. Now we need activities to attract those tourists. Now most countries in the Caribbean, our students, our tennis students, tennis players, does live on going to Begu. 
where they host regional tournaments. Tobago. Right? Why we can't have a tourist center, a, a tennis center in Grenada? Why? I mean, it will do so much for tourism. It will do so much for the hotel industry, the local producers, whether arts or agriculture, whatever it is. It will do so much. You know, it is time. We, we're still in the dark ages. You know, so I want us to, to you know, to, to raise ourselves out of this thing. And we, we need more sporting facility. You can bear it. So much young people. But you could only run around like a horse. Not everybody wants to run around like a horse. You know, we need proper sporting facilities. I was visiting um, in the cemetery one night, one evening in, in Windsor Forest, and the guy was playing basketball in the old community center there in the night. You know, it, you know it's sad that we have spent so much money, but we can't see what, 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 where the money went. You know, so I hope this budget, you know, can really address you know, a lot of these things, you know, that, that, that is, is, is bothering me because, I mean, I, I, I can't get involved in this thing, but I, I look at young people, we blame them when they behave bad, but what do we do, you know, to, to challenge their energy? They have energy, you have to find a way to challenge their energy. Otherwise, the devil, what does say for idle hands? Devil workshop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hazard. Very impassioned, but... Very informative contribution. I hear from you that we need to expand the sports curriculum. We need to expand the sports facility. I hear for you project development for, for tourism in, 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 in different areas. Um, you've given us quite a bit. Thank you very much. Prime Minister. Good evening again, everyone, and thank you very much for coming out. I know it's uh, Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday night. Um, I, I want to say, of course, some of what you've, you've said, for example, what Wayne has indicated would have been said to me while I was campaigning uh, to get into office. And so I'm happy for the consistency. Um, some of what the good doctor at the back has said tonight would have been said to me when I was campaigning. In fact, he said that to me at a cemetery um, in a funeral. So, so I'm, I'm certainly aware as, as MP of some of the challenges um, specific to St. David's and, and in the larger context of Renita. But I also want to say it's important for us to realize that a lot of the challenges we face are not overnight fixes and will not be fixed in a single financial year. Uh, and now we have to sort of plan for a three, four, five, six, some cases, seven, eight, nine, ten year period and then execute that plan. Because part of the challenge that I think we face as a country is the lack of planning or abandoning the plan at the first sign of some sort of, some sort of hiccup. So it would be important for us to, to ensure that when we start something, and I can take the last of just natural works, I'm committed certainly to preserving that site. And then first have a general discussion as to what is incorporated into the site. And I think we talked about that and we've taken steps to do so. Step one would have been to, in fact, terminate the lease for the site, because the site was in the possession of someone else. We've done that. The second step was to go in and actually do a basic inspection of what is the state of the site. And uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure, myself, the Ministry of MIT, we've done that. Uh, the community members came out last weekend to begin the cleanup of the site, and we've done that. But those are relatively easy baby steps. The, the harder things will then be the first question of, from a community perspective, what do we want to do? with the site and having a discussion on it and getting buy-in and assuming we have sufficient consensus and we say yes we know this is what we want to do then we walk backwards and ask how will we finance it who's going to take responsibility for doing it what's the timeline we have and how do we go about getting it and I'm, I'm, I'm speaking like that because I think too often that doesn't happen and we end up actually not achieving anything or we start and we stop because last uh, just wasn't what it is today. It once was a vibrant, thriving space. And the question is, why did it fall apart? Um, you know, Mark spoke about the, the, the drains in the plain field not being clean for 21 years. Why? Right? We can go to Barrett, we can go to Laura, we can go to Bellevue. You know, on assuming office it was clear, 
the policy of the Ministry of Sports seems to have been to only pay attention to major or what they deem major playing fields. And when I asked what was that in the context of St. David's, it was basically last just Right? Now, how could that be when you have a large constituency that has over 10,000 voting, probably a lot more living, uh, and you have all of these smaller fields which are obviously closer to the villages and would probably make more sense to make sure that they're maintained so that people have access. So we have to be able to change some of those policy things and then put the financing in place to make sure that, in fact, that it can happen uh, and, and to make sure that the community is involved because we don't have local government as yet in Grenada. And that's part of the challenge. So even though I'm your MP and I have two or three parliamentary staff, that's not local government. The parliamentary staff has no money. I, as a parliamentarian, have no money. As a parliamentarian, I don't get paid a salary. Right? So I actually have no resources as a parliamentarian to effect any, anything in the constituency. So anything I do in the constituency as a parliamentarian outside of a particular line ministry is done either through the hard work and sweat tears of volunteers, donors, and community activists. I'm raising this because those are some of the, the issues we have to talk about, understand, and begin to address. Because part of the reason why it takes so long to get things done is everything is run through the central government and through the central ministries. And by the time that bureaucracy, and make no mistake about it, everywhere you go in the world, governments are bureaucracies. That's the truth. Some are more efficient than others. <laughs> But the bureaucracies and so it takes a lot longer uh, and and in many instances you have local governments to try and address some of the local issues so that we can get quicker responses but that's part of what we have to talk about as a country if we are addressing our 50th anniversary of independence we have to ask whether the government systems that we have that we've inherited that we've kind of worked along with whether they are effective or not and that's part of the wider conversation that as a country we need to have because that's how we can then agree how we create government systems that are more effective of our needs and that can respond faster and plan and implement than the current system we have. So I don't want it to, to get lost because if we don't tackle that, 75 years from now, we're going to be in the same place, right? As well intentioned as we are, if we don't make sure that the form of what we, the form of the government suits the function, then we, we will also be in, in, in some trouble. So that is part of the discussion. That is part of the budget conversation that we have to have because parliamentarians have no money. As in, they get absolutely no resources whatsoever to address parliamentary needs. Right? What you have is programs being run by various ministries. And I can give you examples. There was a fire in Vincent's. No, fires um, regrettably happen. So by now, there should be a clear protocol in place. And usually, speed matters. Because if your house just burnt, you have no place to stay, you have kids, no place to bathe, etc. Yes, some family may take you in for a day or two. But you would think that there's some immediate sort of temporary response. And then when you hear the bureaucratic process that people have to go through, for example, they need proof of your ID. Well, if your house just burned down, you know, what ID are you going to have? You think the ID is, well, somebody in the community say, I know the man, right? But I'm just giving that as an example, and those are the things that must change, and it's our responsibility to change them so that we could become more responsive. Because when you hear the story, it's laughable. I mean, even I was laughing because, like, you can't be serious, right? So, and then, and then people would say, well, as the MP, why don't you help them? And I'm like, okay, well, the resources aren't at the MP's office, right? And there's no local government to be able to say that within the, the district there's a council that can then take care of some of those things. So those are some of the structural issues that we need to, we need to address also. Um, but that aside, I think all of the comments um, which have been said uh, are noted. We, we would appreciate as the budgeting cycle for any given year there would be a fixed amount of resources and we then have to prioritize. But the reason I talk about communication is because we have to be able to say, okay, these are urgent or these are more impactful because it affects a lot more people and therefore we will attempt them in 2023 and therefore your item we will ask for 2024 or we start the first half of 2023 we try and complete the second half of uh, 2024 as the case might be because that is part of what we have to be able to work with as well because we do have limited resources and there's enormous demand to address a lot of things from infrastructure to healthcare to education to maintenance of our facilities to providing sporting facilities playgrounds etc we are working um, as best as we can um, and we are trying to be as impactful and as focused as we can so there are a lot of community uh, centers and so on that we've begun repairing from Bail Isle to, to, to Barrett we've started in Vincent's we, we, we do in current we started in Mondelez and that's five in, 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 in 12, 14 months 
for things that have not happened in decades. In the case of Barrett, for example, the building was blown off and it stayed as a shell since Hurricane Ivan. And give or take, it's ready for use today. Right? They need to, for example, protect the playing field because people just drive through the playing field and have a ring road. Those are some of the things we're working on. So it's going to be a lot of demand, but I think we have to work with a plan over a period of time um, so that we can look back over two to three years to say, okay, we've made progress because when we got there were two community centers, we have 15. The playing fields will not be maintained. We have a system in place for maintaining them now. We know who's responsible for them. Uh, the, the healthcare challenges, which are the, the enormous ones, but the ones that we must tackle because, to my mind, they're the most transformative, will require a lot of patience, a lot of change to the actual systems that we have, a lot more investment in healthcare. Because the truth is, uh, we have 15 constituencies, and I'm told we have 12 uh, uh, district medical doctors. So right there, it means there are three constituencies that don't have a... If, if, if they were based on constituencies, right, they may probably be based on parish. But even so, if you have one district medical doctor for St. David's, then obviously be joking. Because St. David's, you know, but the point is capacity and investing. Because it therefore means we then have to, to, to create a lot more doctors. And they obviously have to be paid a lot better. And we have to be prepared to do that. So, so if, if, if I like come and I say it's a policy initiative, then we will want to pay the doctors a lot more. There has to be an understanding so that the police officers don't immediately say, well, if you're paying the doctors a lot more, then our salaries have to go by 50% too. Right? There has to be that. Or, or, or teachers can't say, no, 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 no. Because as a society, we have to say, okay, the healthcare is so bad and it impacts all of us. We are accepting that there has to be some prioritization. And there has to be a period when that happens, whether it's increased salaries, increased working conditions, investing to create more doctors, more nurses, finding ways to retain them, doing things like uh, creating a hospital and financing it so that we can also import the technology that will allow us to treat with a lot of those things. Uh, and that's part of what you have to accept. We're not going to fix our healthcare system on our own. We are going to have to import help from outside. And we are going to have to be prepared to listen to that help. And that help could range from diaspora help to straight out foreign help. But we have to be receptive to that. And we have to be prepared to make the sacrifices to invest in those things. If we don't, it will not get better. Because healthcare is a challenge everywhere in the world. You know, places like the UK and so on are struggling just as bad. The waiting list for doctors is just as bad. So it isn't, it isn't, it isn't a reason to say, well, leave it as is. Uh, we certainly have to do our, our best to make sure that we can change it. And I genuinely believe we can do so if we make sure we have a plan, we make sure we get buying for the plan, and then we take the necessary strategic and financial steps to, to make it happen. But I am committed to serving the, 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 the community. Um, I, I was happy for all of the comments um, which were made here tonight. I've certainly taken copious notes. I believe others at the head table were also taking uh, copious notes. And for a lot of the, the, the smaller type infrastructure, road stuff, and so on, I'm sure we can find ways to even start addressing some of those things now, uh, subject to either what is left in the budgetary allocations for 2023 or be able to put them on for, for, tw for 2024. Um, but I, I will also say this. Huh? We have to have a little more community spirit. Right? I, I keep saying that the government doesn't live in the village. You can't hug the government. You know, and uh, sometimes we, we, we buy land like in a private development. We know it's a private development. We buy it from people who don't put in the road. We don't even insist that they put the road in. And then, you know, it, it, everybody builds all the nice homes and then they come and sit to the government and fix the road. And I'm saying, of course, you pay taxes. And so, yes, the government has an obligation to provide infrastructure. But in many instances, we go and buy land in areas where we know it's a private development. We know the, the developer cut up the lawn. They're not putting in water. They're not putting in electricity. They're not putting in the road. We buy. And then we, we then pressure the government into saying, you need to do it and you need to do it now. You know, so I'm saying you know, we, we also have to make sure that we don't let other people use us and then we pressure the government into, into a lot of the things. You know, so, so we have to have a, a lot more community spirit to be able to take care of a lot of the communal things in our communities. Because even if we renovate and fix the community centers, you know, it's difficult for the government to manage a lot of those things. We need the community groups to manage them, to open, to close, to take the lights off, to make sure people don't vandalize it and so on. And so it's also important that from a human organizing taking care of our, our communities and so on, uh, that we have that aspect of it. Because if we don't, we can build all this infrastructure, we can do all these community centers, they will either remain open or closed or people will vandalize them. So I don't want us to forget the human side, the training. The, we talked about the training for, for music, for, for arts, for sports, you know, for, for skills training and so on. 
we actually do need people to be organized so that it, we can actually help help the government deliver those services because our national training agency for example doesn't actually deliver the services what they do is certify someone to deliver the services so if we have people with the skill sets you certainly could come into the nta um and, and and try and make sure that you can be certified or work with them to get you to that point so that we can find persons to help us deliver the skill sets because i have to say this we are truly committed to making skills education just as valuable just as accessible as the traditional academic education that we've been pursuing because i think we all know that we have a significant shortage of skills skilled people across all sectors in grenada and that's where the employment lies not just in grenada but regionally as well as in the world and so we have to make sure that from a value system our parents don't continue making children feel like the only value to you is in what they call them white collar jobs or shirt and tie jobs or the traditional professions uh, when there are all these opportunities to make actually a lot more money oftentimes and a lot more flexible terms in in a lot of the skills skills training area so again thank you for coming out thank you for sharing with us um, we certainly will, will, will take all of the recommendations and suggestions on board. Um, and I, I certainly believe we, we need more involvement from the public in policy making. Right? We need more suggestions and more recommendations, not less. Because at the end of the day, the budget has to work for the citizens of the country. So thank you very much and have a pleasant night. Ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our activity. Let me end by saying thank you to the Prime Minister for taking the time out to be here with us tonight. As you know, he came straight from one activity to attend this one. And um, for that, we are, we are very grateful. Thank you to the members of the team from the Ministry of Finance for their presentation and the the answers to your questions that were given. But most of all, the thanks really and truly goes out to, to you, the members of the community, for coming out tonight, for listening attentively, for contributing, for sharing, because this nation belongs to us, and we are the ones who need to take the action to get it where we need to, to get it. So with that, Godspeed. Please reach home safely. Thank you. Thank you.